Hello everyone, welcome to today's video. Today I'm going to talk about a book. It's a wonderful book. I've been meaning to recommend it for a long time. And the title is Metaphysical Animals, How Four Women Brought Philosophy Back to Life. It's written by Claire McComhill and Rachel Wisman. Um, they're both good friends actually. Claire is at the philosophy department of um, of um, Durham University and uh, Rachel is at Liverpool University. They're both excellent researchers and they wrote this wonderful book. Now why is this book so special? One of the reasons is that the book is, by the way here is my copy, the book is um, very accessible. It is about important philosophers, uh, Elizabeth Anscombe, Philippa Foot, Iris Murdoch and Mary Midgley have all been quite influential in the last um, 70, 80 years, basically since the Second World War. And the book has a very unique and interesting thesis. The thesis is that because during the Second World War a lot of the older dons and younger guys were away from Oxford University, these four ladies studied in an environment that was more open-minded, more relaxed, and more accommodating. People didn't talk over you so much, uh, you could be heard, and there was more variety in approaches, and um, it wasn't just the latest trends that dominated the uh, teaching and research discussions. So they could develop into strong individuals and become successful philosophers. Eventually their talent had time and occasion to blossom and become ripe. Um, now one of the great merits of the book is, you know, this kind of book, uh, it's easy to fall into one of two traps. One would be to focus too much on the personal lives of people. And I think both, all four of these people had very interesting lives um, and unique lives, but, um, you know, you would need to maybe over dramatize or find some special angle and probably be a very strong exceptional writer to write a very engaging book simply that way the other pitfall would be to just focus too much on the philosophy and basically write a philosophy book peppered with a little bit of biography but this book actually avoids both of these mistakes it's very accessible it does explain the main philosophical discussions and ideas of the four protagonists, Murdoch, Midgley, Anscombe and Foote, but it also talks about their private life in an interesting, engaging way that shows very well both the era in which they lived, from the British 1910s, 1920s to uh, the late 20th century, and academic life, Oxford's life, London, the intellectual life, the writing scene, a little bit of the life around Second World War at high level where these young intelligent people could engage um, and make an impact sometimes. And it does this in a fun way, it's just the right mix of uh, novel intellectual ideas, novel concepts that you might not have encountered that show that you know, a good philosopher sees things in an original way and even mundane topics can be explained or understood in a, in a way that shows you that they have deeper connections with other things you didn't realize or there is a reason why they're true or false or everyday ideas, assumptions, they're true or false um, that you that you have not considered before. Now, um, I really have to praise Rachel and Claire here again because uh, this is a very big achievement. You know, it's not easy to write this kind of philosophical book. Uh, one of the other things that's great about this book is if you have studied philosophy or if you have encountered any philosophy uh, from the last maybe 80 years, uh, you must have realized that, uh, especially in the English-speaking world, a tradition which is very reductive, very naturalist, called analytic philosophy has been extremely dominant. And this is not a bad thing, you know, analytic philosophy has a lot of great merits. I myself am mostly an analytic philosopher, I guess, based on my training and what I've been writing and doing so far. Um, 
But there are other interesting things that you can do as a philosopher, and philosophers have done, and the history of philosophy is very interesting. Different kinds of interdisciplinary engagements between philosophy and economics, philosophy and psychology, philosophy and literature, philosophy and biology are very exciting. And there's also just uh, certain people who follow different methods. Just think about Wittgenstein and others. And there has been a trend by some analytic philosophers to be pretty narrow-minded and try to just say, no, it's enough to focus on analytic philosophy. We are asking questions in the right way. We are doing philosophy in an improved way compared to anyone who came before. And we get new, more important insights. Now, I think this is false. Uh, Without saying that any analytic philosophers would be bad or insignificant philosophers, they are significant and many of them are very good philosophers with very interesting new ideas that are worth studying. Uh, there is a lot to be gained from other approaches and uh, other traditions as well. And one of the good things about the work of, um, of these four philosophers featured in the book was that they did not yield to this dogma and the pressure of some others. Uh, influential professors of their time to kind of close ranks in this way and become very focused on the analytic questions um, or the analytic way of doing things. Um, and actually they are very different. Anscombe was a devout Catholic, um, but a very fair-minded Catholic, we have to say. She valued argument and reason very highly. And she has extremely interesting and influential views on many important things, like war crimes, the nuclear bombs, and uh, you might not agree with her, but it's still fun to read many of her takes on things like uh, marriage or having children, as well as more traditional philosophical topics like parthood or events and other things. Um, causation as well, especially she has a very good paper on that. Um, Midgley is a very interesting bird in her own right. She um, became a mature philosopher quite late in her career, but then she became one of those people who could address the crowds and really make accessible philosophy. Um, and she really managed to communicate some key philosophical ideas and fight over simplifications about important aspects of life that came from scientists, who were very smart in their scientific field, but not so far smart in philosophy or public thought and from economics, from the business world, um, you know, there are always pressures on people to have a uniform, simplified view of reality, ideologies, uh, sometimes dogmas, and Midgley was excellent at showing the problems with these kind of simplifications and helping people to um, keep alive ideas and be alive to aspects of life that are not necessarily captured in these other fields. Uh, Murdoch, Murdoch evolved into a brilliant writer. She's a very good novelist. If you want to read some of her books, I would really heartily recommend Under the Net and A Severed Head. It was entertaining and uh, philosophically insightful, psychologically as well, I think. And uh, Foote is maybe the, the person, Philippa Foote, who has most traditionally been an academic philosopher. But even as an academic philosopher, she tried to bridge uh, certain ideas between Kant, between utilitarians, between uh, Aristotle, between uh, people who think about virtue and language and the mind, uh, that some people thought could not be connected very fruitfully. And she's been a very original and influential uh, person if you have heard about the trolley problem, then you must know that she's one of the people who discussed this in a very creative and interesting way. Um, and the other fantastic part of the book is it's just great at giving you um, little snippets of funny interactions with, between these people and um, it's um, excellent also at explaining certain ideas about um, about a range of topics. And one of the most lovely things I found personally in this book um, was a very good summary of Iris Murdoch's earlier ideas um, about literature. And um, and let me read you out a little bit. This is a page 272 from the edition that I have. Um, and 
So here it goes. Um, it is here that Iris Murdoch would locate the great humanity of the artist and the continuity of art and morals. The essence of both of them is love. It was in this interplay between image and reality, art and truth, recollection and recognition, that the writings of Simone Weil first spoke to Iris. Above all, they unlocked the significance of Plato for her. As a youthful communist during the war, lectures by E. R. Dodds had left Iris cold. She had read Plato's Republic in 1940, while busy with the Oxford Rats preparing for another Bolshevik revolution, irony, uh, and had been so disgusted by the old reactionary that, as she joked to a friend, she took to selling the communist daily worker. She had wanted to get close to the thronging multitudes whose lives in mines and cotton mills were a rebuke to Plato's vision of a just aristocracy. Now, in Simone Weil, she confronted a rat who kept the symposium in her pocket. When laboring as a grape picker in Vichy, France, she carried it with her and towed it to her fellow farmhands. In a symposium, Plato no longer holds that knowledge is a matter of the immortal soul, remembering what it already knows, as it was in Nino. Instead, through love of what is beautiful, first, the bodies and souls of particular men and women, then bodies and souls in general, then laws and practices, then knowledge, science, and beautiful ideas and theories. Uh, the philosopher, after all, is a lover of wisdom. The soul can ascend through on the rungs of a ladder and come to gaze steadily upon the form of beauty as it manifests in all these beautiful things, as in the Republic it gazes on the form of the good. So what you get here is a very good, very short few paragraphs, right? This is two longer paragraphs summary um, of a whole intellectual transition that Murdoch underwent, right? She was a young communist because she was very concerned with social injustice and she wanted to help people improve their livelihood in a very um, dire exploitative situation uh, that was present in England before World War II. And um, because of this, she was as a young person very deaf to Plato's messages, but later on, through Simon, studying Simon Weil's books, she realized that actually Plato has a lot to offer um, and has a good story, a good, an interesting, inspiring theory of knowledge that can help us see what the role of art is and how art can help people to um, acquire a certain type of knowledge. And this is one of the things that inspired Murdoch to seek a language in her books where she could tell a story and help people to understand important philosophical messages or messages about their life and their society uh, in a very interesting way. So this is just one of the many, many, many little gems you get in this book. And I really do recommend it to all of you. Give it a read. You don't need to be a philosopher to enjoy it. I think this is something that anyone who is interested at least a little bit in the intellectual development and trends of the last hundred years that shape our current age to some extent as well can enjoy um, you only need an open mind and a little bit of time to read it with that i'll say goodbye for today enjoy your readings everyone have a wonderful week take care bye bye